Ta-da! Talking Tuesday is back. Welcome to the Podcast Daily. That's Bill Landis. I'm Austin Ward. Ryan Day and Jim Knowles back on the podium, at the podium, in the team room. All of those things I think they are could, true. They, they could be, yeah. Does that sound right to you? They will be in the team room. Okay. They're, with respect to the podium, I'm not entirely sure. They're not in a podium. They're at the podium. At the podium. They're not on a podium. But they will be answering questions. Mm-hmm. And Ohio State uh, is 9-0. and They beat Rutgers uh, on Saturday. And they're preparing for Michigan State on Saturday night in primetime at the Horseshoe. So, as always, with the Buckeyes, there is a lot of information to get to. And Bill Landis is going to uh, bring the most probing questions to the Woody Hayes Athletic Center. I gave mine on my five on Monday, as I do every week. Uh, and now Bill's going to do one better with even more insightful questions. We'll see. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of injury stuff, right? But I, is, is special teams most pressing for you? Like, are we, are we at that point? Like, I don't, I want to make sure we're not overreacting to it, but it does feel like they have a miscue every week and a major little, one, little in the way of explanations as for why that is happening. And I don't think. I'm alone in thinking they need to make a change there, but I, I I don't know that I'm convinced that Ryan Day will, but I think that probably is the first question, aside from the injury stuff, right, that needs to be asked on, on Tuesday is like, what's up? What are you going to do? Right? Yeah, well, I, I have been talking about it a lot, and yeah. people are probably tired of me talking about special teams so we shouldn't be talking about it this much <laughs> and that's but that is my point i wish that i had didn't have to yeah it's not like i plucked it out of thin air and was like you know what this year i'm gonna get really worked up about special teams <laughs> for no reason i'm gonna be positive i'm gonna i'm gonna try my best to be uh you know looking at the positives of every game and not dwelling too much on and nitpicking on the negatives for the offense and the defense but i'm gonna channel all the rest in the special teams and i'll be overly critical i I don't feel like that's what i'm doing and if we're talking about all the things that can or cannot get ohio state beat when you're talking about a matchup game well this goes back to last year what would have happened if they had executed or communicated properly on the fake punt in the game what what could have happened if they had done the same thing in the peach bowl now there's a dozen other things in both of those games that have to be talked about especially the counter stallions of it all for michigan And, and if oh, what's, Harrison, that, what's that about it's it's a it's a whole thing you won't even believe it but and then there's marvin harrison and everything else in the peach bowl targeting injuries like and still having a chance to win the game i i understand all that although they did miss a field goal at the end of that game too so uh you can yeah well one could, one could argue that they didn't have a good enough long field goal plan yes you could or they that they should have put the proper amount of people on the field to run the second prime second time they tried to that same fake yeah but, um it wasn't going to work because guess what? They they didn't line up properly. So this has been going on in those big games since last year. And does it does it cost you against the lesser teams in the Big Ten? I'm not even – like Rutgers is a good team, and that very nearly could have made that game a lot different if the defense wasn't able to stand up in that situation and force another field goal. Uh, I, I don't understand it. Not only – I don't think that Ryan Day is going to make a staff shakeup with three games left with an undefeated team and ranked number one in the country. I don't don't think that that's going to happen. But I don't know that we ever got a great explanation for what happened at the end of last season that merited not only retention, a new two-year deal for $200,000 more than he was making before. He's got two Parker Fleming, two years, $500,000, and none of this stuff is getting fixed. So... I don't know. Yeah, it's not. I don't. I don't understand it. And you also are facing a look into the future where James Laurinaitis simply has to have a full time role on the coaching staff, and special teams coordinators are are split at a large number of programs around the country. Most of them. And so, like, you generally, like, you tie tie that in with a position like tight ends. And guess who coaches tight ends? Somebody who's been actively involved in special teams at Ohio State for a decade. Like, yeah. There's such an easy solution, and it may feel like a pointless conversation to have in week 10 if nothing's going to change. But if you're going to, if this is the status quo for the rest of the year, is there confidence that this person can get it fixed? That's the thing for me, because as we talked about before, the margin for error there just feels a little slimmer than it typically is because Ohio State's not scoring 50 points a game. And 
the defense deserves a tremendous amount of credit for standing up the way it did against Rutgers and holding that offense to a couple of field goals when they should have scored touchdowns. But it's going to be difficult when you're playing good offenses. Like Rutgers offenses, they kind of do one thing. They do it okay, but they're they're, they're one-dimensional. They're a little easier to stop in that way. And you don't want to keep putting your defense in, in those situations. And it's not happening all the time, right? But special teams are out there like 10 plays a game, right? It's not... They were running 70 plays a game and having one screw up, then... Well, if it was one screw up every 10 plays over 70, yeah, like, right, like right. what in the world is happening? Right, exactly. And I think that's that's the way to think about it. If you're having one of those, one head scratcher per game is too many for a special teams unit that uh, has no shortage of, you know, talented players uh, at its disposal to use. And, you know, Lord knows Ohio State has enough money to put resources behind whatever it wants. Uh, this feels like a misallocation of those resources. So maybe it's not, are you going to fire Parker Fleming? Maybe maybe it's more the broader, like, why did you, th- why, why was bringing him back in the first place the right decision? Like, where do you think, what do you think about where you are right now? But I, I, I do think it is fair to ask the more pointed question, like, have you considered making a change? Are you going to make a change? You're right. There's three games left. How much do you want to shake things up at this point? And Ryan Day has made an in-season, in-season change before, but that was after the second game of the season. There was a lot of football left to be played. Now you're heading toward the most important game of the season. Maybe maybe you don't want to do that. It just makes me very nervous. I, if I'm an Ohio State fan, I'm I'm terrified that something in that phase of the game is going to cost cost us a win. Yeah, it's it's hard to wrap your mind around it. I mean, honestly, I just a lot of these they're not accidents that are happening yeah. this is you could say maybe miscommunication falls in that bucket i don't think that 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 explanation flies for me what do you think happened there i think when rutgers overloaded one side maybe there was like a check yeah that's what i think too um that's that's the only <clears throat> conclusion i'm gonna jump but the, to yeah but the check is like it's fourth and nine it, it shouldn't yeah <laughs> call, well, call a timeout and, and, and but that's like that's what i don't well, Ryan Day said that he may talk about it more today. On Saturday, he he said, "Well, that's maybe we'll have a, a longer debrief about that." I didn't want to dive into it in the post game. I can understand that, but it's this. That's the same thing he said about what happened with the fake punt last November. Uh, as mis miscommunication signal. It's like, okay, well, at some point in the chain of command, you are giving a green light for a fake, not giving a green light for a fake. Then your special teams coordinator has to have installed a fake and be able to relay the signals and communicate that to the players on the field. Or if it's an automatic, that they understand what the rules are and when you're going to do it. So could be all of that stuff. Mm-hmm. I, at what point is the br- miscommunication happening, I think is pretty important because it's happening repeatedly. Yeah. I don't, I don't know how that's allowable. It shouldn't be, and there, Parker Fleming talked, I think, in the spring. <clears throat> I think it was in the spring. It might have been in the preseason this year. Like, Doug asked him a lot about that. We didn't really get to talk to Parker Fleming about those miscues until well after the season was over. But when Doug did, Parker Fleming talked about the mis- miscommunication piece of it and said, like, that falls on me, which is, like, no kidding, it does. But So, like, he took ownership of that, and it keeps happening. So is it time to nip that in the bud? Like, I, I, I don't know. It's I'm, I don't want to say it's so cut and dry only because of the point of the season that we're in. But it goes back to like, to your point, the off season. Like this never should have happened in the first place. And and explain it. I mean, if if it's happening with the coaches, generally they are held publicly accountable for that. Not always. They the, the staff talks during the season, but they're not all available every single week. I, just for the the sake of uh, clarity and information for you all out there, I've requested that Parker Fleming be available for interviews this week to. Uh, Ohio State. So we'll see if that happens. I'm not going to hold my breath on it. But, you know, when when the offensive line goes through a rough patch, Justin Fry is the one to talk about that. When uh, when I've had questions about Ohio State's defensive line in the rotation, Larry Johnson, uh, you know, talks about that and, and clears the air and explains his motivations for doing so. This is to the point with special teams. Like, I think that that should happen um, because I don't think that the onus is is solely on the players, and I don't think that Ryan Day is the most involved on an hour by hour basis with special teams. So he is not. Yeah, and your players' preparedness is a reflection of your coaching ability, right? So 
they're the, you're right. The players are, one, are the ones on the field to like ultimately ultimately make the mistake. But who's trying to get them ready so they don't do that? And then why does it keep happening? Yeah. So we're gonna try to have as much of that conversation as is practical or rational. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, I'm curious to see like how. Do you think it's going to be like a large chunk of the press conference? I think, I, prob- I think probably not. Probably not. I, it just, and for the same reason, like because it's only 10 plays compared to offense and defense and quarterbacks and injuries, like all that stuff is you, in the grand scheme of things, like going to outweigh special teams. Yeah. And that's, I understand that. And, and if people think that I'm making too big of a deal out of it because of that, maybe I am. I, I don't I don't know. I, I just yeah. They're costly, costly mistakes and there's huge chunks of yardage available. Mm. And it hey, how many times is Rutgers gonna march seventy yards against Ohio State or eighty yards? Like right. It's not gonna happen. And it's easier for them to you know get twenty thirty and kick a field goal. And if you did that a few more times, say or if they were if somebody slips and then you score a touchdown, like that wasn't Ohio State's defense fault that they had to go back to back times on short fields. Like they did a great job bowing up. Shouldn't have had to. Period. Yeah, right. I think I think it's three questions. Are you making a change? Slash, have you considered making a change? I'm doing a Tim May thing. I guess that's two questions. A couple quickies. A couple quickies. Um, if if not, or like why? Either way, I guess. And then go back to the beginning. Like what happened last year that made you want to? Re up this Give guy for two more years. Yeah, I think that's it. I think those are the three. okay. And then it'll probably put to bed. I think so. It won't be the it won't be the entirety of the press conference, but it could be a big chunk of it. Yeah. Well, it just it, it depends. Yeah. Anyway, all right. Well, that's that'll be the base of Ryan Day wants to be with it. I guess. Yeah, that'll be the special teams uh, treat of the week. Yeah, and then I imagine we'll go to the offense. Yeah, I I don't even know. Like, it's the same stuff, right? It's like. How do you find a way to score like two more touchdowns in the first half <laughs> so that everyone can like relax, relax a little bit? Um, I don't like, and it's like last week, I thought the reasons it didn't happen were a little bit different from the reasons why it didn't happen before. Like, if G Scott catches a pass, who knows what might happen on that drive? If Julian Fleming catches a pass, who knows what might happen on that drive? And I'm not trying to take the onus of Kyle McCord. Like, mm-hmm. he threw a bad pass to Marvin Harrison Jr. on the same drive, and that was there for a long completion that was underthrown. Like it's all every, everyone's owning a piece of it. Mm-hmm. Um they didn't block a defensive end on one play for some reason. Like there's plenty there's plenty to go around. It's just like you're waiting and you're waiting and you're waiting for like everything to sync up. Like, okay, there's the Ohio State offense. And even if it's a lesser version than what we're accustomed to, which I think at this point it's going to be, but which and that's, I think that's fine, but I think it just needs to be hitting a little better than, than it's hitting right now and they've played nine games and it doesn't feel like they've made a ton of progress and i don't like why does ryan day think that is, is it because there's been like a, to be fair key guys out of the lineup like I, i'm not i'm not diminishing the impact of that but you want to see either like a, like the defense sort of like hit its stride immediately and it sort of carried that through the year that's one way to do it or you want to you want to feel like you're building towards something and i don't know if i feel that with the offense i don't think they've taken steps back i just think they're kind of what they've been for the last four or five weeks and it's a little frustrating and i don't know maybe, maybe by this point it's it's foolish to expect it to get better maybe that's just that's just who they are but i wonder where ryan day is on that as he tries to find a, a little bit of a better gear on the offensive side of the ball you think that they're gonna get to ann arbor and just be like guess what here comes 50 meta concepts and here's <laughs> 10 play action deep shots i, I there's part of me I, i'm not i'm not suggesting this that they've been purposefully vanilla i do believe the the build part with first time quarterback three new offensive linemen the things same same things that i've been saying since september i do think are true but when i watch like must have situations like fourth and seven at notre dame or you know key key third downs and you see the concepts that are like oh that yeah that's the stuff that ryan day brought to ohio state like i recognize that there is part of me that's like I think he is trying to get by and keep things in reserve for the game. I, how much? I don't know. And maybe I'm 100% wrong about it. It just feels like we, we, I brought it up with him a couple of weeks ago. It's like, well, can't you just do some of that third and fourth down stuff on first down? Like, yeah, I don't right. think anyone can stop it. 
And he's like, uh, I don't know, maybe we will. <laughs> that's tuned. a good idea. Like, yeah. uh, thanks for bringing it up. Uh, you want to come sit in the coaches meeting? I'm like, no, that's that's my contribution. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I there is always some element of that, like holding holding stuff back for the biggest game of the year. I don't I don't know that they are holding a whole lot back at, at this point. Um, and actually, like in a, in a weird way, I know that that game was incredibly frustrating for people to watch at certain points, especially in the first half. If you like make go down the list of things that have been issues for Ohio State this year, like red zone scoring generally, they were good against Rutgers. Goal to go situations, they've been pretty terrible all year. Scored all the all the, all the times they were there against Rutgers mm-hmm. um, through the air, even through the air, which is yeah, that's a real revelation. You can throw the ball down there. Um, Marvin Harrison Jr. is good there too. He is. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Third and one, they converted two of them. One didn't look pretty. It was close. The other one was a, was a QB sneak that was great. They went with the throwback. Uh, everyone looking to the sideline. What play are we running? And Rutgers is like has its back turned to the play, and Kyle McCord just gets three yards on the QB sneak. It's great. So like they are doing some things that I that I actually think, if we're being fair, are markers of progress or at least steps in the right direction against what is a pretty good defense. Um, it's just it's frustrating to see like or it's frustrating I guess to feel or expect that Ohio State is just going to go down there and score every time it gets the ball because that's what we're so accustomed to. And then, like, it doesn't happen. So it's like, okay, what's wrong? Mm -hmm. Um, And then you see, like, quarterback play that I would say, like, erred on the side of tentative. I don't don't think it was as tentative as I said myself initially right after the game, after going back and rewatching it a little bit. But there was still, I think, a little more there that that Kyle McCord probably got got, got in the offense into if if he was a little more patient. Um, So they just, I don't know, they got to find ways to take those steps, man, because I – what we've seen so far could certainly be good enough to get them to where they want to go. I, I, I'm not sitting here telling you like it's definitely not going to be, but man, I'd feel a whole lot better if they showed like an ability to take even just like one more step forward uh, as an offense in terms of being able to finish off drives and score more points. Yeah, I was wondering because clearly, I clearly I know that most people were basing their evaluations on Saturday off of the first half. And that was, I called it abysmal. So I have to put my hand up first of all to say, like, I was calling it that at that time. And then it was, and it wasn't good enough for Ohio State. But sometimes I think that they don't get the benefit of the four quarters. And I know that mm-hmm. the counter argument to that is, well, if you put yourself in this situation in a playoff game or in a Big Ten championship game or in Ann Arbor, you may not be able to dig yourself out of that hole. And I totally understand that. But I, I think they deserve credit for making adjustments and they're built differently this year than they have been in years past with a defense that can allow the offense some room to get through that. And and I think that trying to judge them based on their worst moments or their worst stretch of a game and, and then whether that's McCord specifically or the offense as a whole or, or whatever else, like it does a disservice to getting 60 minutes because, and I, I only, I, I'm not saying that to, convince anyone that they have to look for nothing but optimism and positives out of the game. Yeah. But you look at Texas or Georgia in the fourth quarter against Missouri or Florida, Florida state at certain points. Like, I don't, I don't feel like other we're in this. We know Ohio state standards are, are incredibly high. I don't feel like anybody else really gets judged by their lowest points more than Ohio state. <laughs> that, yeah. And that's the part that I've tried to like re- get out of my brain. Um, and sometimes I succeed and sometimes I don't, but like they won against the, it came back and beat the team that was number nine in the country in total defense on the road without three of their starting, three of the starting guys in the secondary without their captain at tight end. And they, and they wound up winning by 19. Like that's not nothing. I don't, I, I, I understand the, the need to look at areas that can be improved, but sometimes I think we miss the, the rest of it's still pretty darn good. Yeah. Is that um, if you don't. You don't love me at my worst. You don't expect me at my best. Is that yeah. what the summer we're at with Ohio State? That's, um, Ryan, Day. <laughs> Ryan Day's got that tattooed yeah. on his body yeah. somewhere. <laughs> I think uh, I there is a there is a quality that I think is worth uh, taking the heart a little bit, like that you can make adjustments that you do find ways to play better in the second half of games than you do in the first half of games. I, I think ultimately championship teams have to have that quality about them. Just the fear of, of the hole being too big, I guess. Yeah. Um, and no, I, I understand that part. And 
maybe that fear should be lessened a little bit by how well this defense has played this year. I know like this this past game was maybe not their best performance. Um but it was fine. Like they were on a short field a couple of times. Um like I, I, I get where it's coming from. You just like Ohio State fans have seen enough good football to know what a championship team looks like. And I think they're still wanting to see a little bit more from this offense to truly believe that it's there. So I, I totally understand that. I'm just blessed to have uh, Allie and Berm around who, who remember 2002. And they're like, you think that this is bad? <laughs> Berm was going like off the top of his head in the car back from, on the ride from Rutgers. Like those games were hideous, not yeah. like complete games, not just like one quarter. So yeah. Anyway, but that was a long time ago. It was a long time ago. Yes, we're old. All right. Uh, anything on defense? I thought Jim Knowles' reaction to Rutgers running the ball on them was interesting. He was just sort of like, "Oh yeah, like we we expected them to do that." We're like, I don't. There were this has not happened for the entirety of the game, but there was a a period of time in that game that lasted more than like one possession where I thought Rutgers was pushing Ohio State around a little bit, and I don't know that it makes me nervous, but it makes me nervous. <laughs> <laughs> about like about this is the most unease we've had from Bill Landis yeah, on the talk I, on I Tuesday. It's not like I'm not I, I'm not super on alarm about it. I, I think it was they were bound to have a game eventually where they like were not clicking on all cylinders for the entirety of four quarters. And like they only gave up 16 points when they could have given up 30 with the field position they were put in. So right. like they still played a good game. Um, I just like I I, I guess I want to like take the temperature of Jim Knowles on like where they are as a run defense because they've been very good all year. The restrictions were that didn't, that didn't look tremendous. Actually, I thought they did a good job with the quarterback run and limiting the impact of Gavin Wimsett. But I wonder, like, was there a trade off there? Like we're going to give up a little more in the other areas because we're so keen on making sure that this guy doesn't kill us. I mean, maybe that's what it was. So it's not like, Oh, forget everything you knew about the Ohio state defense are not as good as we, as we thought they were. I, I'm not, I'm not nearly there at all, but that was the first time I think we really saw a team at least since the Notre Dame game, like have any kind of success like that running the football, even for a small period of time. So like, where do they go from there? I guess, as they try to address that, especially if the challenge is a little bit different this week, because uh, you mentioned it right off the top. Some of the injuries are the most pressing thing and how Ohio state wants to manage that in a game where they should win easily at home against Michigan state. So Lathan ransom, you know, as we sit here getting ready on a, on a Tuesday morning, uh, don't expect him to play. Could be ready for Minnesota, but the, they're really targeting to try and have them back by the end of the month. Don't know any real insight on Denzel Burke. That's not really as much of a factor into the the running game part that you're talking about. Yeah. But there's you know, Josh Proctor. You have to get through concussion protocol. I think that he will, uh, at least based the way that, assuming he feels the way he did as he left the stadium on Saturday. Yeah. Um, you'd have that piece back. Uh, it's not uh, impossible to think that Tommy Eichenberg may. He won't want it. He won't ask for it. There's a world with the way Ohio State's handling this stuff where that nature of that injury could force him to maybe be limited or, or perhaps in a role like Cade Stover was last week where it's emergency only for him. So that could you know, put some of that emphasis on testing the depth there with Cody Simon and Steel Chambers. We know what they can do, but maybe this is a week where after all all year long talking about it, that, that C.J. Hicks could, could play oh, a, a role in that. I mean, that's it's not impossible. Uh, I'm saying that it that that could be a discussion based on the size of the ice bag that was on Tommy's uh, arm after he tried to get back into that game on Saturday. The, looked like the left elbow. Um, I mean, that's on the table, and the same the same will be true for you know getting Cade back. How much do you need that this week? Um, Ameka didn't look a hundred percent in that no, game on didn't. Saturday, so you know those things are are a big deal. We know on a Tuesday that we're not going to get a lot of answers on that, but it's going to be a key part of this week because, and maybe the way that I would look at it with Ryan Day is like, are you managing these differently? The decisions, are you being more conservative and cautious uh, if it's close? Cause it seems like they are. I don't remember yeah. having a lot of stuff like Cade last year where it's like, you're dressed and you're just not going. Anywhere. I wanted to ask that last week and then ultimately did it. I can't remember what I ended up asking about, but that was on my mind last week because we went into that game um, relative to Omeka. Yeah. Um, after Ryan Day said, like, oh, yeah, you could have played. We decided not to do it. Like, that feels different than, than last year. And it certainly happened with Cade. I don't – my 
my initial thought was that's what's going on with Denzel Burke, but then I thought like Ryan Day's answer after the game was like, oh, maybe it's something more than that because he didn't really want to get into the details of what was going on there. So that is the one that is is probably most front of mind for me. And like Jermaine Matthews has played great um, when he's been when he's been called upon. It's not being like wary of him not being up to the task. It's just like they need Denzel out there. He's one of their most important players. So um, I don't know where that's going, but that, that that is the one that I think I'm most curious about right now. Yeah, and I think that that's, that's the risk of lumping multiple players into one question with yeah. Ohio State. Because he asked, Lathan Cause he asked and, about the yeah. timeline for Lathan and Denzel. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I understand where, where, when you're going to get one question in those post-game press conferences, you want to get them both. At, but it also allows an escape hatch yeah. where you don't actually get the information. So we'll try. And then we'll, after today in the Woody Hayes Athletic Center, we'll be back uh, for a Woody Wednesday. And we'll try and get a look at how some of those guys look as they get ready for Ohio State, as Ohio State gets ready to host Michigan State on Saturday night. We're in those uh, beautiful grays. I like the grays. They're not too bad. I like them better than What about the, the land of the wolf ones? They're awful. <laughs> Just terrible. You don't want to bring those back? No, they have nothing to do with Ohio State. <laughs> it's because Urban Meyer decided they wanted those players to be wolves one year. <laughs> and then it was the next year that they were. They'd already got rid of that mantra. They, yeah. That was a great time in uh, sports jersey. <laughs> World. Um, but yeah, so the Buckeyes will be in gray. They will be playing in primetime this week, and we'll have so much more coverage coming your way uh, throughout this week on the podcast. We thank you for getting ready on a Tuesday with us, a talking Tuesday in the Woody Hayes Athletic Center on the podcast daily. He's Bill Landis, and I'm Austin Ward. We'll talk to you later.